This happened not long ago. I'm 15 going on 16. I live in New York City and have had some strange late night experiences before, but none as disturbing as this one. My parents were out of town. It was a summer night. I was at a pretty large party. There was quite a lot of drinking and smoking, which is expected at a party with a bunch of 14 to like 20 year olds. I'm pretty tall for my age, like 6'1", and I have a pretty deep voice, so I easily pass as older. I knew that I had to get home on my own, so I tried to regulate the amounts of drink that I had. At around maybe 2 or 3 a.m., I realized that I should start heading home. It was a Friday, and I didn't have anything to do the next morning, but still, I was tired and figured most people would be leaving soon anyway. For those of you that don't know, New York City's transit system runs 24-7, 7 days a week, so I wouldn't have any problems hopping on a train, even at 3 a.m., to get home. The party was in Far Rockaway in Queens, and I live in an apartment building on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, so I had a pretty long ride to get home. I wasn't worried, though. I was no stranger to long commutes on the subway. I would take the train everywhere I went since I was like 9 or 10. I headed over to the Far Rockaway, Mott Avenue train station and sat on one of the benches. There's a screen that says what time the train will be coming, and this late at night it would be a while. After maybe 10 or 15 minutes of waiting, the screen showed a train in Wood 207th Street 20 minutes. I waited for a while longer until I saw the headlights of the train coming down the tracks. The train arrived, but since this was the first stop, I had to wait about another 10 minutes until it would actually leave the station. I got on and a few people exited, leaving the car empty. I sat all the way at the end of the car, so I wouldn't be next to anyone if anyone else got on. At this point, I was really, really tired and felt like I was about to just pass out right there, so I did. For those of you that don't know, New York City subway cars are rectangular with three doors on each long side which open at the stations and one door on each short side where people can walk through from other cars. I woke up a little while later to the sound of one of the short side doors close to me opening. A man who appeared to be homeless walked in and the smell immediately hit me like a truck. I remember him having raggy clothes and tangled hair. He looked at me. Hey brother, you got a dollar? Uh, nah man, sorry. I responded. Come on man, I, I know you got something. He insisted, smiling for some reason. Not for real, I... I don't, I'm sorry. I didn't have any singles, just a few 20s, and I wasn't about to give this guy $20. He just stood there for a few seconds and said, Alright, whatever, and walked away, still smiling. Now, this didn't strike me as weird at all, not yet at least. I've been living in New York my whole life, and I'd gotten used to all the homeless people in the subway and them asking for money. It didn't bother me. I looked out at the stop I was at. I was just in Brooklyn. The A train ran local at night, so my ride would be longer than usual. I figured I still had a pretty long way to before I got to the 42nd Street in Manhattan, where, where I would transfer to the Q train that brought me to the station near my apartment. So I went back to sleep. When I woke up again, I was in downtown Manhattan, I think like West 4th or 14th Street. I was getting close to my stop. I looked around and the train wasn't empty anymore. There was a guy sitting on the other end of the train with his headphones on, and in the middle of the car, there was a guy sitting there, head down, muttering to himself. I was pretty sure it was the same guy that had asked me for money before. I thought that was a little weird, but I wasn't nervous or anything. I just figured he had some sort of mental illness or something. After a little while, I arrived at the 42nd Street Station. The guy was still there, and when I got off the train, he must have been going in a similar direction as me because... He got up and off the train also. Now, 42nd Street Station is huge, and I needed to go all the way to the other side of the station to get from the A train side on 8th Avenue to get to where the Q train was on 7th Avenue. Walking through the huge station, specifically the passage that takes you from one side to the other, I'll admit was a little creepy. It was eerily quiet for a place that usually is packed with so many people during the daytime. The only other people around now were late night workers and homeless people. I arrived on the side where the Q train would be going uptown towards my stop. When I got to the platform there were only maybe three or four other people that I saw waiting for the train like I was. 
I walked over to the benches and sat down to wait. I looked up and saw that there was a guy, a little further down the platform on the side from where I came from, standing there, muttering to himself like having a full-on conversation with nobody. I couldn't make out his face from where I was sitting, but I was sure it had to be the same homeless guy that I'd seen on the A-train. Now I was getting a little suspicious. Was he following me? The train arrived after a few minutes and I got on. I'd only have a few stops from where I was to my apartment, so there was no point in trying to sleep. The man boarded the same car as me and I could see clearly now it was him, the same guy. There wasn't anybody else in the car at the moment. I wasn't entirely nervous, but at the same time I was definitely on edge now. I tried not to look at him to avoid eye contact. He was still mumbling to himself and now I could pick up on some things he was saying. Random phrases like, Should I? Maybe. Help me. When I got to my stop, I promptly got up and got off the train. Honestly, at this point, I wasn't even surprised when the man got off too, still talking to himself. The station was completely empty. It was 4, going on 5 a.m. by now. I walked through the station up the stairs toward the exit, ignoring the man who was definitely following me. When I got to the street level, I started walking faster towards my apartment. The station was on 72nd Street. I still had to walk a few blocks further up to get to my apartment. I looked back a few times to see the man, still behind me, speaking pretty loudly now. I was honestly more annoyed than scared at this point. Maybe it was the tiredness, maybe it was the little bit of liquid courage left in me, but I was seriously done with this guy's stuff, so I stopped walking, turned around and said, Hey, can I help you? I just want some money. I know you got some. Listen, I don't. Leave me alone or I'm calling the cops. He said something about how I don't know all the stuff that he's been through and then just walked in the other direction, still muttering angry slurs under his breath to himself. I continued home, shaken but too tired to think about what happened at this point. I got to my apartment and went to bed. The next morning, my friend who lives in the same building as me called me and asked if I'd heard about what happened last night. I hadn't told anyone about the incident yet, so I said I didn't know what he was talking about and he explained. Apparently a neighbor in our apartment building who was coming back from an early morning jog or something called the police because there was a man lying outside the doors to our apartment. As he was arrested, he was yelling and screaming, resisting arrest yelling stuff about how his life was horrible and how he was waiting to kill that person last night that didn't have the heart to hand over any money to him. I assumed the guy that he was referring to was the guy that I had encountered last night and the guy that he was talking about was me. And he must have followed me all the way to my apartment which, given how tired I was, must have not been that hard to do without me noticing. Who knows what would have happened if the police didn't take him away. The man was obviously seriously ill and I do hope that he gets the help he needs. All I can say to you all is be safe when you're alone at night. Especially in the city, always watch your back. This story didn't actually happen to me, rather to a close friend of mine. He told me the story a few hours ago and I wanted to share. He lives in Hayward and was attending a march for the BLM movement at around 4pm I think. I don't know what streets or anything specific like that. He had just sent me a couple of videos of the crowd marching and taking a knee. So after about 10 minutes, he said that they were passing through a street lined with shops and alleyways. There was an older man sitting on a curb by one alleyway watching the march. Jordan describes the man as looking upper 40s, wearing a black and white flannel shirt and jeans and a cap. Jordan had the misfortune of walking nearby said alleyway and the man stopped him, saying something along the lines of what he needed help fixing his passenger seat since the recliner handle was broken and it was a two-person job to get it back into its upright position. The man gestured towards his car, which Jordan examined. It was a black Chevy Malibu that was parked in possibly the most sketchiest part of the alley, 
right towards the back, kind of hidden behind a trash dumpster. Jordan declined and quickly walked away before the man could say anything else. Now for his sake, I wish the story ended here, but I wouldn't be posting it here if it did. I think sometime later, like an hour maybe, Jordan decided to start heading home while the march continued. He says he was cutting across some field that was in between houses where only two other people were in sight, and as soon as he emerged at the other side, his air was suddenly cut off as a thick arm wrapped around his throat and began aggressively yanking him backwards. Of course, Jordan yelled as loud as he could, and thankfully the aforementioned two guys began to rush to his aid, shouting at Jordan's attacker. The guy let go and pushed Jordan. As Jordan stumbled forwards, he spun around and saw the guy who had asked him for help with his car, hopping into the Chevy Malibu and speeding off. The two other people asked Jordan if he was okay and comforted him and whatnot. Keep in mind that Jordan only told me this over a few texts and I haven't gotten a chance to talk to him in public about it, so some details were spared. I think Jordan contemplated calling the police but didn't think it was worth it. He told me that they were probably already busy enough and he might be ignored or have an extremely long response time to which the only info he had was a description of the guy. He hadn't gotten the guy's license plate. Jordan went home and that's pretty much all he told me so far. It might sound cliche but please, everyone stay safe. These are terrible times and with all the looting and protests, stuff like this is bound to happen in the shadows. Like all women, I have a fair amount of creepy experiences with men. I have a whole host of stories I could tell here, but one of my more memorable stories happened when I was a student. For context, I went to university in France and spent a few months doing an internship in Paris where this encounter took place. I was only 20 years old and so, it being a Friday night, I was on my way to meet some friends at a restaurant. The apartment I was living in was in close proximity to a couple of metro stops and the line I needed was a few blocks away on a pretty busy street. When I was only a block from the stop, a guy looking to be about my age suddenly approached me, asking me if I knew where the metro stop was. I indicated the large yellow M glowing above the stop on the corner and thought that that would be the end of our conversation. Instead, he fell into step with me, explaining that he wasn't from the city and didn't know the train lines too well. I said it was no problem and he gave me a funny look as he asked, you aren't from here, are you? Hmm, I thought. He was right. French is my second language, and although I've spoken it from a young age, I still have an accent on a few words. Normally, I don't mind having an accent or people remarking that I'm not French, but when a guy you just met on the street one night comments on it, it can make you a little uneasy. I confirmed, though, that I wasn't French, and we actually ended up having a decent conversation as we walked to the metro stop, down the stairs, and through the turnstiles. During that first, and what would turn out to be our only conversation, he seemed nice enough and didn't set off any red flags. I told him where I was from and what I was studying, and he told me that he was in the city visiting some friends. We ended up getting on the same train though even then I questioned whether he was actually going the same way as me or not, and kept talking until my stop. Right before I got off the train, he asked for my numbers so that we could meet up sometime, and in a move completely out of character for me, as is talking to strangers, I did. Big mistake. He texted me that Sunday, asking if I wanted to meet up on Wednesday. I agreed, but then he asked if we could meet at Chatelet. For anyone who doesn't know, Chatelet is an enormous metro stop near the center of Paris. Several metro lines run through it, as do other trains that go out of the city proper. It also connects to a huge shopping mall. When he asked this, I started to feel uneasy. My intuition told me that there was something wrong with wanting to meet up in a place that had so many ways in and out, a place where if you got on a certain train or were forced to do so, no one could find you. My mind tends to jump to worst case scenarios, but my gut is never wrong. In any case, I tried to give him the benefit of the doubt, as he supposedly didn't know the city that well, so I told him that Chatelet was pretty big and it might be hard to find each other in there. I suggested meeting up at the bookstore in the Connected Mall, still a public place but less hectic. 
but he didn't seem to like the idea and stopped replying to my messages. The next day, Monday, I was on my way to a meeting with my boss when my phone buzzed and I saw it was a text message from him. Can you call me now? Another message came in. Or can I call you? My intuition spoke up again in the back of my mind, telling me that something still wasn't right. I replied, I'm going into a meeting right now, let me get back to you. With that, I turned my phone all the way off and didn't turn it back on again until after the meeting was over and I was on the bus home an hour and a half later. Turning it back on, I almost dropped it as it started to buzz uncontrollably with several dozen text messages loading simultaneously. I only scanned them, there being so many, but they seemed to range from proposing that we meet at a friend's house on Wednesday night to why won't you answer, where the F are you? followed by a number of missed call notifications, all from his number. My intuition was doing more than pinging at this point, so when his number popped up on the screen again, I turned the phone off again until I reached my apartment. Once again, I dare turn it back on and saw even more missed texts and calls from him. Pretty spooked at this point, I shoved the phone back into my purse and made dinner, not even looking at the phone until well after I had eaten. Once I could stomach it, I took the phone out of my purse. I felt a shiver go up my spine as I saw that he had called me no less than 16 times and that his text messages had become more and more vulgar before ending with a final, fine, I guess this isn't working out. Maybe I'll see you again. Goodbye. I've never blocked a number so fast in my life and immediately called my mom. I could barely hold the phone again though this time it was because I was shaking so badly. To this day, I can't help but feel that I dodged something extremely dangerous, more specifically, someone who was probably just looking for a girl to take advantage of and jumped at the chance when he met a young foreign one in a big city. I'm still not sure what possessed me to give him my number, but I console myself with the fact that I didn't tell him I was living near that metro stop where he approached me. I just have a feeling that he might have come looking for me. The lesson that I have taken away from this incident aside from never giving my number out ever again is to always trust my gut. She saved me before, saved me that day, and will most likely do it again. Back in 2005, I was 15 years old and like any teenage girl, my main source of income was babysitting. I mainly babysat for two families, Family A, which was every Monday and Wednesday for four hours in the afternoon, and Family B, which was different evenings when the parents had events they wanted to go to. The moms of the two families were first cousins, and the mom of Family B used to babysit myself and my sisters when we were little. All of us, myself, Family A, and Family B lived within a five-mile radius of each other in the Michigan countryside. On the night my story takes place, I was babysitting for Family B. It was a Friday night in the middle of summer and the two children, a boy, four years old, and a girl, two, went to bed fairly easily. I know it was after 10pm because it was dark out when the little boy came downstairs and said he couldn't sleep, so he wanted to sit on the couch with me. I was watching the movie The Patriot on TV and let him snuggle up with me and he went right back to sleep. Shortly after he came down, the phone rang. I looked at the caller ID to see if it was the family calling when I saw it was my home calling. I answered the phone and it was my dad. He said something that basically boiled down to this. Hey, so there's an escaped convict in the area. Police are out looking for him, so if you hear police sirens or a helicopter, don't be alarmed. And then he hung up. I, quite frankly, was terrified. I was a 15-year-old girl alone in an old farmhouse the nearest neighbor was about a quarter of a mile away and I had two babies in the house that I had to protect. My dad had sounded so cavalier like he was warning me that it was going to rain. I had no idea what this man had done to be chased by the police, but it had to be bad. I went looking around the house for something to defend us with. All I had were kitchen knives, no baseball bat, no crowbar, and no access to the gun in the safe. I ended up calling my dad and asking him to come stay with me. He actually thought I was being ridiculous, but I didn't care. I felt better. Thankfully, nothing happened. 
When the parents got home an hour later, my dad explained why he was there. The mom was very understanding and showed me how to get into the gun safe and where the bullets were. Like I said, she was our babysitter growing up and she was basically my older sister. She was and still is a big believer in the Second Amendment and self-defense. But my story didn't end there. That next Monday I was babysitting for Family A which had two girls, four years and two years old. The older girl was telling me a story about someone in the backyard and how they couldn't go back in their house and had to stay outside all night. When the mom got home I asked her about it. It turns out that the previous Friday the police had been at their house until the wee hours of the morning. Family A's neighbor had a restraining order against her ex-boyfriend for domestic violence and he had shown up at her house late on Friday. She called the cops and he had fled into the property of Family A because he had several arrest warrants out. The police kept Family A out of their house for safety reasons while they searched the area and they eventually found the guy and took him to jail. That's what all the fuss was about that Friday when I was babysitting for Family B. Fortunately, he never got close to Family B's house. That incident was the start of me being more proactive in safety, making sure I knew how to lock the doors, where any weapons were, and to make sure I had a knife with me at all times. If something like that ever happens again, I know I will handle the situation much better. I'm a 17 year old girl who goes to the local high school here. I never really had much dating experience, but this guy clearly didn't have much either. When this story takes place, I was around 14 years old. For some quick context, in my state you are legally allowed to date someone under 18 so long as you are 2 years older or younger, meaning that someone who is 16 can date an 18 year old, but a 14 year old dating an 18 year old could lead to serious consequences. I've been a part of a classroom that we refer to as BMC, which is a class for kids with behavioral issues such as anger or depression. I've been a part of this program since middle school, but never have I been through a person quite like this. I normally keep to myself, listening to my music at a deafening volume, and because of this, I never had friends in that classroom, especially since this was during my freshman year and sophomore year. I was nowhere near popular during that time. Yet, I did happen to get several desperate guys approaching me. Normally, I would reject them, yet, for some reason this time, I didn't. Maybe it was pity, perhaps. I was waiting at the far end of the bus loop one day, given the fact that my bus was a special needs bus. As I was listening to music, I saw a boy approach me. He was bigger in size, always seemed to wear the exact same superhero shirt and jacket. I still to this day don't even know if he even washed it. For this story, we'll call him Freddy, mainly because he reminded me of the freaky animatronic. Anyway, he came up to me and told me that he had a crush on me, despite me not even knowing his name prior to this point. I was a little creeped out by this, so I was a little lost in terms of words. He asked for my number. I said yes, but then what he said next later gave me goosebumps. This is very important to keep in mind. Don't tell your parents he said. I asked why and all he said was, I could get in trouble. At this time I was very gullible and thought, why get him in trouble when he doesn't know better? See, I'm autistic and at the time I had a feeling he was as well. Before you go off and tell me that he really doesn't know any better, I should tell you that just because someone is autistic doesn't mean that they are dumb or can't be manipulative. Even people with mental illnesses can be a bit of a bad apple. I know that from experience with Freddy and many others. When I gave him my number, we small talked for a small bit until my bus finally arrived. Even at the time I was so relieved to see my driver to see that I would escape Freddy, so I bid my goodbyes and he waved. He then said to me, I love you. I nearly vomited at that statement. I gave him a bewildered look and he asked, Too soon? Yeah, too soon, I confirmed. I hurried onto my bus and sat down. I tried to avoid looking in the window so I didn't have to look at him. Once again, he was far from attractive or even hygienic. I soon got blown up by texts from him to the point that I had to turn off notifications for his texts. But then when I did respond, he would complain and ask why I wasn't responding. 
When I said I was busy, he would just ask when I would be done. When I told him I didn't know in order to buy myself some time away from him, he'd just text me 10 to 15 minutes later asking if I was done. Clingy people were my biggest turnoff, especially since I was that person at one point as well. I know that being on the receiving end of that sort of affection can be very uncomfortable. When I finally had enough, I casually told my parents the whole story. They panicked and told me to block him while they contacted my BMC manager. The next day, my BMC manager called me to see her privately. She explained that even though he was a senior, he had attempted to pull these things off with several girls before me. She explained that he knew full well what he was doing and that I had to stay away from him. I got scolded by her and family that next time. I should communicate what is happening, especially given the fact that this boy was far from the first boy to attempt to take advantage of me. He was luckily one of the few that failed, thankfully. I am sad to say that even though I went through this experience, I still am too gullible and always have been. And because of this, I'm asking all of you, regardless of your gender, to consider what it is you want. If you don't want to follow your gut or communicate your feelings, you could fall into the same trap I've fallen into more times than I'd like to admit. My name is Chloe, I'm 21 and I'm from Scotland. In 2018, me, my ex and his little brother decided to explore abandoned places. We stumbled across an old abandoned mental hospital, Lennox Castle Hospital is the name. We decided to check it out, bearing in mind it is approximately 10pm so it was dark. We went in having to climb rocks and stuff, and when we got in, we were just wandering around enjoying scaring each other like you do. My ex, who we'll call C, went into one of the rooms. Me and his brother stood outside, we'll call his brother R. Me and R were standing at the window of the room C was in when we heard keys being shaken behind us. I thought it was my keys, but then I remembered C had them in his pocket and he was in front of us. We kept hearing movement as well, when there wasn't any wind. The next time I went up was with four of my friends towards the end of 2018, the middle of winter and around 10 to 11 p.m., so it was pitch black. There was me, A, K, J, and T. Me and T kept hearing high-pitched screams coming from above us, but no one else had actually heard them, and they thought we were just joking. We also kept hearing movement in the bushes, and again, no wind. The walk back down was probably the most terrifying thing to ever happen to me. T told me she had seen glowing red eyes in the trees. I told her it's her mind playing tricks trying to create a reason for the noises we heard. We walked further down and I had the feeling that I had to look into the trees. And as I looked, I saw them. The red eyes. I tried to pass it off telling myself that it was an animal in the trees, but Jay had the light and it was way ahead of us, but not only that, the trees were far apart and on a hill. The eyes were between the trees and looked like they were floating. No one else had seen or heard anything. We had no explanation for why it was just me and T who had seen them. Fast forward to tonight, 11pm. Me and my best friend Jed decided to check it out. We walked up but kept hearing screeching. We passed it off as possibly being foxes. The movement started up again just as I remembered it. The screeching was the same noise I heard before but this time Jed had heard it. We got to the hospital and we were quite far back from it. I had my flashlight on and I pointed it towards the building. Jed stood mesmerized by it as it's a lovely structure. I stood my light to one of the windows and I had saw a railing. The railing looked like it had a black figure standing, holding on. I mentioned it to Jed and all he said was, No, top left. He paused. I asked him what it was and he rushed me back to my car. When we got back to the car, he said he had seen a pure black figure in the top left window, which twitched its head as if it were trying to get us to go to it. All the way back to the car, we hear footsteps and the screeching again. This place definitely has something going on and I will not stop going there until I find out exactly what. This happened to my grandpa. I'm not sure exactly when this happened, but 
This was when all my younger aunts and uncles weren't married yet and still live with them. In all, I had seven uncles and five aunts, just from my dad's side of the family. Years ago, my uncles bought a house and my grandparents lived with them. A lot of paranormal stuff has happened in that house and I don't know why my grandparents didn't move out sooner. At the time of this incident, everyone was out shopping or doing whatever they used to do outside of the house, and it was just my grandparents' home. My grandpa sat in his big chair, as always, and was occupied by the television. Usually, my grandma would stand behind that big chair and just watch TV with my grandpa. I don't know why she always did that when they had so many other couches to sit on. After a while of my grandparents just watching TV, my grandpa spoke. Honey, go grab me something to eat. I'm hungry. My grandpa waited for an answer. Did you hear me? Silence. My grandpa was in his late 70s, so his body was quite weak. That's why instead of turning around to see if my grandma was still there or not, he reached over his shoulder to where she'd usually be. Instead of a shirt, however, he felt a soft breast that would belong to a young lady. Just as he was about to use his strength to turn around to see who or what was behind him, he felt a hand on his ear and side of his head. The hand then slowly started moving towards the middle of his face. Once the palm of the hand covered his cheek and the fingers reached his nose and mouth, he opened his mouth and grabbed a hold of one of the fingers and bit as hard as he could. As he spit out the finger, he felt the hand pull away fast. He finally looked behind him and saw no one. He didn't bother wasting his energy to look around as he knew he wasn't going to find anyone or anything because, as he recalled, he didn't see or taste any blood when he bit the finger off. But unexpectedly, the finger that he had bit off had fallen onto the floor, and it was real. There was no blood or anything, just a clean, chewed-off finger. My grandma finally showed up as my grandpa picked up the finger. Here, he said, handing her the finger. As expected, my grandma freaked out and asked, What is this? He explained to her what happened and he told her to keep the finger for good luck, as he said. It may seem crazy, but my family is a religious shaman family and we, or the elders at least, believe these things. I've actually never seen the finger myself, but one day when I was young, I saw my grandma in her room picking up a small, red triangular pouch that she dropped. I didn't know then, but usually those pouches were filled with herbs believed to keep you healthy, so I stepped into the room asking, What is that? She smiled before answering, It's a finger. I live in Utah and I go camping a lot. I've got it pretty much down to a wrinkle. Usually I do a bunch of research on the areas where I plan to camp, even missing persons in the area or identified remains that have been found, accidents, anything creepy of note because I love macabre stuff like that. I was coming down from Salt Lake and wanted to visit my great grandfather's ghost town first which is fortunately all on private property now as well as check out Castle Gate Cemetery. If you don't know about the Castle Gate or Winter Quarters mining disasters, you should read about it. The Castle Gate Cemetery contains the remains of 171 men who died in a series of mine explosions on March 8, 1924. It's just really eerie seeing the same date of death on all the grave markers. It was a very small town and almost all men of working age died that day, leaving almost every woman in the town a widow. The bodies were unrecognizable aside from some bits of clothing, so there aren't many names along with the grave markers, just a white cross with March 8th, 1924 inscribed on them. Anyway, my story isn't about that. My final camping destination was near Vernal, so I had to take a scenic route to get there. I really enjoyed the drive, so I started taking it more often on many trips to the Vernal area. Recently, my fiancé, who we will call Colby, and I noticed some pretty sweet looking camping spots along the way, so we decided to camp there last month. It was great, beautiful, and easy to access for our SUV. I preferred to camp as far away from people as possible while still having my car nearby, so this spot was ideal. 
I hadn't noticed any signs except that we were camping in the Ashley National Forest, which is weird because I always thought that the Ashley Forest was closer to Flaming Gorge. It's just really big. Colby and I love camping, so we decided to take his 12-year-old son, who I'll refer to as Kyle, with us for the Father's Day weekend. Kyle had never been camping before. The night before we were due to leave, I couldn't sleep at all. I had an abnormally long anxiety attack which was unabated by my anxiety medicine. I couldn't shake the feeling that something awful was going to happen to us if we went. I spent the morning crying and shaking, wondering if I was experiencing a legitimate gut feeling or if it was just my mental illness causing me to think irrationally. I voiced my fears as Colby also experiences anxiety and he is incredibly understanding when my mental illness gets rough. I didn't want to ruin Father's Day for him and our kiddo and they were very set on going. I eventually calmed down and we arrived at our spot after about a two and a half hour drive. There were no people around which was fantastic. The area is home to a lot of free range cows and there happened to be a ton of them around our campsite. They kept their distance and we left them alone but we had a plan to jump in the car if they get too close or a bull came along. The weather was perfect. There weren't too many bugs, and aside from the cow pies and incessant lowing of cattle, I couldn't have asked for anything better. Clearly, my anxiety was just that. Anxiety. We each set out to prepare the camp. The boys focused on the fire pit and gathering wood while I set up the tent and inflated the air mattresses. We planned to sleep in the tent while Kyle slept in the car on a twin-sized air mattress so he would be plenty comfortable and safe. We have a decent amount of gear, so the spot was pretty awesome once it was all finished. We even hung up a string of solar-powered lights for when it got dark. Around this time, a very large bull came along, so we had a chance to implement our emergency plan of getting in the car, just in case. He just kind of herded the cows away from our area. It was nice having the cows gone as the sun was setting. All we still needed to do was make dinner, so... I started working on that while Kyle hung out in the back of the car on his mattress, snuggling up with a blanket, as he had been saying he was tired and wanted to take a nap. Colby and I went out to gather more wood, and though we didn't mention it to each other at the time, we both felt very uncomfortable. We didn't want to go far from the campsite or split up. We just had this feeling of being watched, like something was lurking behind the many bushes around us. I attributed it to a stray cow or maybe some deer. We returned to the campsite less than five minutes later. Sunset was gorgeous from what we could see in the clouds, and this was about the time that Kyle got up and wanted to wander around. I totally understand wanting to roam around and explore as a kid, so that was normal. He started walking off in one direction, and his dad said, Where are you going? To which Kyle responded, Places. He then turned around and walked to the tent like that's what he wanted to check out. Maybe 20 minutes later, he said he saw some eyes reflecting in the trees behind us and that he was going to check it out. I just laughed and said, nope. Besides, dinner is going to be ready in another 20 minutes or so. I thought maybe he had seen another cow or deer. No big deal. He and his dad were on the other side of the car when I pulled dinner off the grill. I stood up to tell them that we could finally dive into a tasty tinfoil dinner of chicken, potatoes, broccoli, carrots, shallots, and garlic. Not to brag, but I make a dang good fine campfire dinner. It was incredibly dark, the kind of dark that only really remote places can get before the moon rises, so we were using our flashlights pretty heavily. I did a quick scan around with my flashlight and straight ahead of me, a stone throws away, and about five or six feet off the ground, I saw a pair of eyes reflecting back, just staring at me. They were not the eyes of any animal. They couldn't have been a cow, deer, elk, bear, or mountain lion. They were just barely reflecting, and they were very close together. They looked distinctly human. There's a person just staring at us in the middle of nowhere, I asked. They didn't make any noise getting there, and they did it in the dark without a light. My stomach sank, and every hair on my body stood on end. I called out and said something like, Babe, come look at this, because I was unsure of what I was actually seeing. As I partially turned to look for my fiancé, my flashlight left the eyes and I immediately whipped it back over. 
the eyes were still there, just staring at me. That's when I realized how real it was. Most animals would have bolted away after that, and a cow would have made noises getting there. I was frozen, my eyes trying as hard as they could to see any form of the darkness. As Colby came around the car to me, the thing stood up, unnaturally quickly, and the eyes went up to about ten feet off the ground, still staring at me. That's it. A human is scary enough, but some ten or eleven foot humanoid creature with that kind of speed is beyond terrifying. I backed up and yelled, Get in the car! Get in the car! And my voice was shaking. My lovely, obedient son, for the first time in his life, didn't ask questions and just hopped in the car. I threw myself in the back with him and Colby got in the passenger seat as I had piled some bags in the driver's seat. Stupid, I know. I quickly described what I saw and I noticed I was visibly shaking. I'm not the toughest chick around, but I had been through a lot of stuff I probably shouldn't have survived. I've done solo camping trips and solo hikes and I've never been spooked. I've been snorkeling in the ocean at night and seen eyes reflecting or eels and stonefish within a foot or two of me and I might shiver a bit, but that's nothing compared with the absolute terror I felt upon seeing those eyes rapidly ascend. Colby quickly moved the bags and climbed into the driver's seat, started the car and turned on the high beams. We couldn't see anything, but we knew we needed to leave. We pulled the car right up to the tent, grabbed our machetes and told Kyle to stay in the car no matter what. Colby covered me while I grabbed the bags of our clothes out of the tent and I doused the fire with a few gallon jugs of water we thankfully had nearby. Needless to say, we flew out of there like banshees, leaving the tent, cooler, and dinner still steaming on the grill. The drive down the pitch dark canyon was nerve wracking. After we had all been silent for a bit, trying to make sense of the situation, Kyle asked, What color were the eyes that you saw? and I responded that they were light bluish green. He said, That's what I saw too. I asked him how far apart the eyes looked. He said they were close together, like a human's eyes would be. I know now that human eyes reflect red, so it couldn't have been a human. Besides, I don't know many ten-foot-tall people. We pulled over at a well-lit gas station when we got to the nearest town and booked a hotel room for the night. On our way there, we noticed a car following us closely. We were already unnerved. Colby slowed down a bit in case they were wanting to pass us, and then we saw the red and blue lights blinding us through the mirrors. He pulled over and an officer told us that we were going ten under the speed limit. He asked where we came from and where we were going and we told him the truth. We knew it sounded insane. We hadn't been drinking, we didn't have anything illegal on us, but I did still have the machete next to me. Luckily, he didn't notice it and he seemed interested in the story. He said, and I quote, Doesn't really surprise me. I heard a lot of stories of weird stuff happening up here. He told us to have a nice night and let us go. Thanks, officer. We returned to gather our stuff in the morning and nothing had been touched. The food that was sitting out, the chicken, the bread, the bag of garbage, nothing was disturbed or nibbled on. Later that night, I decided to do more intensive research on where we had been camping. I finally found the name of the actual canyon, Indian Canyon, and it turns out the Indian Canyon is a hotspot for paranormal activity and Bigfoot sightings. It's also very near the Skinwalker Ranch. Kyle thinks it wasn't a big deal and that we were overreacting, which is fine. I don't want him to have nightmares about it or anything and he seems totally okay with it, aside from the fact that he was deprived of the s'mores making experience. Maybe it was nothing, but maybe it wasn't. I'm not taking my chances. We have promised to take him for another camping trip so he can have the s'mores, but we will not be visiting Indian Canyon ever, ever again. This all begins back in December of 2014 and ended around December of 2018. I'll include as much detail as I can remember and will also change the names of people since events and stories like this are often met with doubt or ridicule. In 2014, my pregnant wife, our son, my wife's niece, 
whom we gained temporary custody of for a year so she could finish high school, her son and I all moved to an area close to where I grew up in central Texas. It was a growing suburb with good schools and a good community that was located close to where I was working. To the east is a large, safe city, and to every other direction is ranching land, hill country, and old creeks. We found a house to rent in a subdivision that started being built in the late 90s and finished around 2010 that had a nice creek running through it. It was once a Texas Ranger fort before the Civil War. There were many skirmishes that occurred in this area between the Rangers and natives. Some of them are pretty well known if you know the history of the area. There were a few locations a few miles away where the natives massacred settlers traveling between towns in the early to mid-1800s. Also, there is a location not too far from where they found remains of a 14,000 or so year old Neanderthal, which at the time was one of the oldest ever found in this region. I guess I'm saying this is old and has some history. Anyway, after the Civil War started, the Texas Rangers abandoned the fort and it was almost immediately set on fire by the natives. We rented this house during the summer. There was nothing special about it. It was one of possibly ten home models what were built in that section of the subdivision. Every house had two trees in the front yard, a two-car driveway, and around 20 feet of HOA-approved grass between each house. We lived so close to the elementary school that we could hear the bell for school every day. One afternoon, I wanted to show everyone the areas I remembered growing up. We drove by the house I grew up in, my old high school, and a few other areas I remembered running around and causing the same minor trouble you did growing up in what was once a small town of 2000. We passed the old burnt down house that was said to be haunted by the meth heads that everyone talked about but no one ever saw, the woods that was said to have giant shadow dogs running around at night, and finally the cemetery that the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre opening scene was shot at. Our niece was fascinated with the cemetery because even though that area was built up, you could still tell it was most likely filmed there. Since she liked it so much, I thought I'd give her a scare by driving everyone by the old cemetery on the other side of the town. It was a private cemetery that was located off of one of the FM roads and said to have some of the settlers that were killed by the natives there. This place probably hasn't had any new arrivals in about 70 years. It was getting dark by the time we got there, so I decided to pull off the road to try and shine my lights on it so everyone could see. As soon as I did, I felt off, like I shouldn't have been there. The area was in the middle of a drought, and because of that, all the ground had massive cracks in it. Some of the markers and headstones had fallen over, and the ones that were still standing were leaning over pretty bad. The picket fence surrounding the markers were barely standing and discolored, and even though no one did maintenance on the ground... It looked like the grass wasn't wild. Instead, it was oddly bare compared to the surrounding area with only a few tufts of tall weeds scattered about. Just then, the sun set behind the cedar and oak trees that covered the horizon. That looks creepy, my wife said jokingly. Yeah, with the way the headlights hit the rocks over there, it looks like dolls sitting on the ground, I said, trying to scare our niece. Only when I looked harder, there were old dolls sitting upright in the middle of the cemetery. Old sun-bleached dolls. They could have been there for a few days or a few months. It had been so hot and dry in that area for so long you couldn't tell. Everyone in the car got quiet, just staring and trying to figure out if we should laugh or be freaked out. The wind blew a little and something caught my eye. There was a lone dead tree off in the distance. This tree was an old post oak about 40 feet tall, completely bare of leaves. Originally, what I thought were branches, small branches, were actually what looked like chicken bones hanging, a lot of them. And yes, there were dolls hanging too. All right, who wants to get some snow cones? I said as cheerfully as I could in an attempt to disrupt everyone's gaze before they saw what I did. The mood quickly changed as our son, our niece, and her son all hollered, Me! And just like that, Everyone put our previous stop in the back of their minds as they went through all the different flavors that they wanted on their snow cones. About a week later, our son, who was about six at the time, started telling us he was seeing shadows in the halls and eyes looking down at him from the AC vents in the house. 
Our niece started complaining of shadows in the house and a feeling like she was being watched, while her son, who was two, would walk, point to walls, and start jabbering to them, then would suddenly get upset and start crying. My wife and I never saw, felt, or experienced anything and didn't really think much about it other than it was a new house for us and the kids did like to watch scary movies. One night I had to go drive past the old cemetery for one reason or another. While passing it, I thought I saw a deer out of the corner of my eye. I immediately slowed down except it wasn't a deer. It was some kind of large shadow that moved across the tree line and smoothly into the cemetery then vanished. Well then, I said to myself in disbelief, this is where it all began for me. On the way home, I felt like I was being followed. I kept looking in all my mirrors, taking side streets, going through subdivisions, going through parking lots, but there were no cars following me. I jumped on the toll road and floored it, turned around, got back on it and went home. When I got home, the kids were watching a movie and my wife was in the kitchen, making herself a hot Cheeto sour pickle covered in Kool-Aid with lime juice and a warhead in the middle. Yeah, I don't get it either, but she was about four months pregnant at the time and finally started the show. I rubbed her belly and gave her a kiss and told her I was going to lay down for a few minutes. It was dark, but still only about 8.45, three to four hours before everyone went to bed on a weekend. At the time, we had a headboard that had curved decorative steel bars spaced about 18 inches apart, so you could see and touch the wall, and if you reached far enough, you could feel the carpet on the floor. I was laying down on my stomach, trying to clear my mind and had just closed my eyes when I had this feeling of dread. After about 10 minutes of this, I finally opened my eyes, expecting to see the wall. What I saw instead, I will never forget. It was a face grinning back at me from less than six inches away. It had red and black skin, no hair, black eyes, and bright yellow teeth. Imagine a mix between Darth Maul from Star Wars Episode I and the demon from Insidious. My brain said, stay calm, don't show fear. But my mouth said, F this. My mind started screaming, get out of here, but with every ounce of self-restraint I could muster up, I rolled out of bed, turned my back to this thing I just saw, and walked away down the hall and back into the living room. I thought you were going to lay down for a while, my wife said with a sour look on her face as she took a bite from the sour science experiment that was on her plate. Yeah, I think I'm going to lay down in here instead. I thought I saw something. I replied calmly, trying not to freak out my family. I don't know how I did it. I've been in combat situations in different scenarios where my life and lives of people around me were on the line, and I don't think I've ever felt more physical and emotional fear than I did in those ten seconds. Not only did I see what at that time felt like the pure incarnation of evil, but it was in my house where my pregnant wife slept, where my son played, where my niece's son liked to hide. This thing was in my house, and it was playing games with us. Over the next week or so, things were getting worse. I was having nightmares and hearing footsteps in the house. My son was having night terrors, and our niece couldn't fall asleep and her son was always crying. I was new to my section and had recently changed jobs when I re-enlisted, so it was a new situation for me and I worked along many civilian contractors. Most of them were retired sergeants major, a few of them were lower enlisted guys that just happened to be at the right place at the right time for a job opening when their contract was up. Mrs. Z was somewhere in between. She was one of the only contractors I spoke to regularly, so when I came into work one Monday looking like something was wrong, she asked me if everything was okay. I was trying to test how she would respond. My son is saying he's seeing shadows in the house and it's keeping him up at night. And last night was a rough night. I said, Really? Is your house haunted? She said, totally serious. Boom. Question answered. I looked around. Uh, well... I proceeded to tell her everything that had happened. She explained to me that her family were strong Catholics and from Brazil. Her mother was able to sense things, could see auras and could end up giving me some tips that might be helpful. Well, nothing helped. 
Then finally she said her family was going to South Texas to see some friends this coming weekend, and while they were there, they were going to stop by this miracle church to pick up some holy water and would pick some up for me as well. That next Monday could not come fast enough. At work, she handed me the holy water. I looked at it. it was in an old Ozarko water bottle. Odd, but who am I to say what type of container such a gift should be held in? She told me what to do. Put it in a spray bottle. Spray every corner of every room of the house, every closet, bathroom, pantry, up high and down low. Spray above every door and every window, every AC vent. Do this all while saying this Bible verse. Start in the front rooms of the house, leave the back door open, and slowly work your way to the back door so anything in there is forced to leave the house. She handed me a slip of paper. I looked at it and it read, Plead my cause, O Lord, with them that strive with me. Fight against them that fight against me. Take hold of their shield and buckler and stand up for mine help. Draw out also the spear and stop the way against them that persecute me. Say unto my soul, I am thy salvation. Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Let them be as chaff before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. For without cause have they hid from me their net in a pit, which without cause they have digged for my soul. Let destruction come upon him at unawareness. Let his net that he hath hid catch himself in that very destruction. Let him fall. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. After you are finished, keep it in your wallet for as long as you can, so it'll always be with you, she said with a smile. As soon as I got home, I did exactly as she said twice. That evening, there was a noticeable change in the house. Everyone was laughing and having a good time in a way we haven't had in months. When it was time for bed, no one had any complaints and all the kids went to bed without any problems, including myself. I woke up in the middle of the night unable to talk, unable to move. I was completely paralyzed. I don't know if it was from fear or sleep paralysis. Something was in my room. I could sense it. I could feel its hate towards me, feeling ice cold like death while burning up from the pure disgust. It was watching me, and it was angry. You know how I said seeing that demon thing was the most frightened I'd ever been? Nah. This... This is it. I could feel my death. I could feel the hatred this thing had for me. I was fighting to move, fighting to tilt my head, even a bit so I could at least look at what was going to end my life. Then suddenly I remembered. My pregnant wife and the little baby girl that was growing in her belly were laying right next to me. I stopped fighting it. What if it moved and woke her up? What if her being asleep is the only thing that is keeping her from experiencing the fear I'm feeling? What if her sleeping happily right next to me is what is keeping her safe? What if I wake her up and it kills all three of us? I accepted my fate. If me dying silently in the night means she is safe, fine. So I closed my eyes, I relaxed, and started praying. God, please protect my wife and children. Please let me fall back asleep. Please keep them safe. If I die tonight, please let me die in my sleep. I must have said it a thousand times in my head. I wake up to my alarm going off. I made it. I'm alive. I lean over to look at my wife and suddenly her eyes pop open. I gotta pee. And she hobbles quickly to the bathroom. I get ready for work and that was the last I ever saw the demon creature, but it isn't the end. Over the next three years, my beautiful daughter was born. My wife started working again. I got a promotion, and everything was going amazing. Then I developed heart problems. Pericarditis at first. Then I was diagnosed with Brugada syndrome, which is very serious. The doctor said that I could drop dead at any moment, and it's amazing you haven't already. Thanks, doc. A month later, I had a defibrillator implanted in my chest, and eight months later, I was medically discharged from the military. I was 27. Our niece and her son moved out. Then in June of 2017, my sister passed away from a seizure suddenly. 
She had some serious medical problems, but was working through them and for the first time in a few years had a positive outlook on life, making plans for the future, and was back to being the beautiful person she'd always had been. It hit the family hard. One night in August 2017, I was unable to sleep. My new job had me working nights, so on my days off, I'd go to sleep at around 3am. My wife was already in bed. I went to lay down, but kept hearing noises, creaks, chirps, and what sounded like footsteps. You know, the kind of stuff you write off as the house setting, the wind blowing outside, or the AC kicking on or off. I kept my eyes closed mainly to not alarm myself and try to force myself to fall asleep. Then I got this feeling that something was in my room. It wasn't like the feeling I had previously. I was just uncomfortable, like something was off. I opened my eyes and as soon as I did, a shadow bolted around the corner of my room. I thought it was my wife. Babe? You okay? My daughter moved around in her crib a little and looked over to her only to see my wife asleep next to me. This happened a few more times, but things were starting up again, slowly. It started with my oldest son sleepwalking. He had never done it before. We would wake up with him staring at a wall in our bedroom. It completely frightened my wife for the first time, and I'm not going to lie that I thought he was possessed or something the first time. He was just standing there in the corner of the room, breathing hard, and would quietly say, Ha, ha, ha. Really creepy. But after the third or fourth time we found him doing that, or found him walking around the house, we would just gently guide him back to his room and everything would be okay. He never remembered it in the morning. Then about three months later, the sleepwalking stopped. I kept hearing the footsteps though. Light bulbs would go out faster than usual. Different rooms of the house would always be extreme temperatures. One room would be uncomfortably warm while another room that was along the same exterior wall would be really cold. The insulation in the attic seemed to be the same. There were no outside factors like a tree blocking one room and not the other and the AC vents were never clogged or bent. My wife would mention all of these things to me but she never really wanted to discuss anything that was going on. It freaked her out but she didn't want anyone to know how badly. Whenever I would talk to her about it, she would just nod her head and agree with any situation I thought would fix or explain it. She did ask to place crosses above the exterior doors in each room, and that's about it. One night my wife took the kids to one of her friend's houses about an hour away, which left me alone. This doesn't happen often at all, especially at night. I'm used to kids running around, babies crying, dogs running into things, and barking at squirrels that constantly pester him outside the window. So I use this opportunity to, as any parent could, sleep. I like to sleep in the living room on the couch. Something about my back being to the wall in the center of the house. My wife doesn't understand it, but this is my time. She isn't here to pester me and try to convince me to sleep in the empty bed while she's away. So, I turn on Netflix, put on a Planet Earth documentary, and slowly drift asleep to the narrator's calm voice and whale mating calls or something like that. I'm suddenly awoken by a loud scream. I look towards the TV. Netflix is already in its are-you-still-there mode. I look at the clock, a little after 3am. Did I scream in my sleep and wake myself up? I jump up. If it wasn't me, that means there is someone outside my house, again. I forgot to mention, we have had a problem recently with high school kids throwing parties like they do, getting busted by the cops, and running away through people's backyards trying to get away. Annoying, but nothing too major, we've all been there before. Just be prepared to get yelled at if anyone catches you. There was also a break-in on the other side of the neighborhood a few weeks prior, and these events were unrelated. I jump up to get my gun I have hidden away in a drop-down shelf behind the couch, a recent purchase that I was quite happy with. I run to the door, look through the peephole, see no one is there, so I open the door. I walk around the outside of the house as quietly as possible. I don't want to startle my neighbors, they already don't like me too much because of my new work hours. The wind blows and my dog goes absolutely crazy inside the house. I take off, adrenaline pumping like crazy. I thought for sure someone was inside the house. The door had closed slightly, so I shoulder it. It flung open, nothing. I was fully expecting someone to be in my house. 
Instead, I see my dog slowly raise his head and look at me like I disturbed his sleep, then turn his head and go back to sleep. I checked every room in the house, under every bed, moved all the clothes hanging in every closet, everything. The house was empty and I was unable to fall back asleep until my family got back the next morning. Everything got quiet again after that. My wife had our youngest son, June of 2018. In December of 2018, I began going through confirmation classes through the Catholic Church, and this is when things started happening again. The footsteps, shadows, all of it. I would hear scratching on the exterior door about four times a week. Whenever I got up to look out the peephole, there would be no one there. My father-in-law had a job near we lived, and instead of staying in a hotel, he said that he would pay us what his company gave him for a hotel if he could stay with us. We thought that was a good idea. He quickly began to see things, shadows. He said he is seeing shadows pass by his door, what looks like a person walking past the bathroom door when he's shaving. He started hearing footsteps walking down the hall to the room he was staying in. He jokingly asked me about it and I gave him a brief rundown of what had happened over the past few years without giving in to too much detail. He said he believed me and that he had never felt anger, just annoyance from whatever it was. One night while I was working, my oldest son had his friend over. I get a call at around 11pm from him crying his eyes out and barely understandable. My wife grabs the phone. Hey, you get that? What? No, what happened? Is he okay? He said he saw your sister in the hallway. I started to tear up. My oldest son and my sister were very close. She worked in a comic book store which hosted different card game tournaments and even got opening night tickets to many of the new Marvel and DC movies that were coming out. What more could a boy want in an aunt? Wh what My sister? What do you mean? She handed the phone back to him. Dad, I saw her. She was just... standing there. A wave of emotion came over me, followed by a wave of questions. What did she look like? Was she happy? Sad? Did she move at all? How did you feel when you saw her? These were all the questions I could think of. What I would tell my family to do next depended solely on the answers to these questions. She looked happy. His ten-year-old voice broke a little. She smiled and waved at me. I felt happy when I saw her, he finally said. Oh, good. She just wanted to let you know that she was doing okay and she missed you. I said, trying to calm him down. If it was anything else, I would have come home and we would have stayed in a hotel for the night. It's been about eight months since that happened. Since then, nothing creepy has happened in my house. Absolutely everything stopped. I am thoroughly convinced that my sister made everything leave and that was her way of letting everyone know that my family was safe. I told one person about my story. They wanted to know more about the first time I felt the demon in my room and I felt I was going to die. They tried to relate to it to my heart problems. A symptom of Brugada syndrome is a racing heart, like 300 beats per minute, which causes blood to not flow properly to my brain, which leads to blacking out. Without immediate medical treatment, the person will die within minutes. They said that experience could be the result of being awoken because my heart was literally about to beat out of my chest and everything else was my brain trying to understand what was happening. I don't know, I'm not ruling it out, but the doctors said that if my heart begins to show the symptoms there is literally 0% chance of pulling out of it without getting resuscitated. The scream I heard when I was alone may have been someone outside when I went to check they may have tried to come inside only to be met by my intimidating 40 pound Brittany Spaniel, not very likely since I could have possibly seen them run away from the house and my dog is lazy but not lazy enough to fall back asleep immediately after barking at a potential intruder. Those are all the explanations I could come up with. We move out of the house in a few months to a new construction on a few acres out in the country. Hopefully nothing follows us or nothing is already there. Angry people are disturbing their final resting place. My sister has already saved my family once. I don't want her to have to do it again. And now here I am, 
in a newly built house at 1 a.m. It's June 2020 and three days ago the lights of my daughter's room turned off. I was in the room next to my now almost five years old daughter, my wife was in the kitchen, my youngest son was asleep and my oldest was playing Xbox in the playroom. I say this because there is no way someone could have turned the lights off without me seeing them. I even heard the click of the switch. My daughter's been terrified of her room since we moved in. We thought it was because her room is far away from us and big, but now that all of this has happened again, I'm starting to question things. It made me sit down and think about all the times I thought I felt things touch my arms or legs and just blew it off thinking it was a muscle spasm or twitch of the skin. Sometimes I see shadows out of the corner of my eye. That got me thinking about the first time I thought I saw a ghost, how I felt there was evil in my childhood house, the times I almost died, the times I should have died. Recently, my oldest son told me a story about walking around in the storm drains of the old neighborhood which led me to conclude what him and his friends saw was a skinwalker. I'll post those stories if this one goes well, possibly a few of my friends from overseas stories as well, and answer questions if you'd have them. Thank you for reading. When I was a young girl, me and my family used to love going to historical sites and learning the history of the many towns we visited. Me, being a young history buff, jumped at every chance to go to old battleships or naval graveyards. So when my mother informed me that we were going to one of the tallest lighthouses in the United States, I was ecstatic at the chance to climb that high and look over the beautiful landscape that surrounded it. This trip in particular was close to my birthday, so my parents agreed to allow me to bring a friend along. I chose my best friend at the time. For the story's sake, we'll call her Sarah. Now this lighthouse was part of a haunted tour and I begged my mother to allow us to go at night with the paranormal team to do the spooky tour instead of the normal one. Being young, she wouldn't allow us and it was past the time that she would like to be in bed. I really didn't believe in ghosts at the time, I just wanted to go for fun's sake. So disappointed yet still excited, I agreed to go on the regular tour during the daytime. So we arrive and buy our passes to climb the lighthouse. My mother starts her ascent up the lighthouse's winding stairs, followed by my brother's father, me, and my friend Sarah. As soon as I walked through the doors, I started getting an uneasy feeling, but attributed it to the thought of climbing up the very tall monument and standing out on the edge. How I wished I would have listened to what my gut was telling me. It was a hot day, so I had my hair up in a ponytail and as soon as I got about one-eighth of the way up, I felt my hair being slightly tugged. I turned behind me and told Sarah to quit messing around, I hate getting my hair pulled. I, growing up with two brothers, will do this to you. She gave me a puzzled look and claimed it wasn't her. I brushed it off thinking, oh, she's just messing with me. Next thing I know, I feel a hard tug that causes me to fall backwards down the winding stairs, cracking my head open in the process. My mother rushed me to the hospital and after the initial shock and pain wore off from falling down solid metal stairs, I started to get angry at my friend asking her why she tripped me. She swore up and down she didn't do it but I refused to believe it. But the thing is my mother had taken a picture about one minute before my fall which showed Sarah way too far behind me to have caught up to cause the incident without me hearing her loud footsteps running up behind me. My mother also corroborated this story by telling me when she turned after hearing me trip. My friend was far down the stairs as she had to stop to tie her sneakers. It then clicked. The uneasy feeling. The hair pulling. The unnatural cold air I felt around me just before the fall. After this, I never doubted that there is something after death. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly, and if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data located anywhere you listen to podcasts.
Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And always remember to charge your booty binky.